over here. It's uh, you got a screen. You really need to keep the time. That's yes, I know. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I can see your facial expressions during all the other talks. <laughs> okay, I'll try to do the best I can. I'm normally accused of high speed. You ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, so I got this recording. I hope I got a recording. Let's see. Okay. Well, they don't have to cause crises. And it's, I'll go through logic first of all and get to some solutions later. And as Richard said last night, and Schumpeter said back in 34 and earlier again, as Richard pointed out, they create money out of nothing, which sounds like myth, myth to my neoclassical friends, but I'll show why it's not shortly. And they, they don't have to cause financial crises either, but they almost always do. I'm going to put that position against two conventional and false beliefs. One a lot of the public have is that you must have a crisis through lending because they lend at $100, they expect $105 back, uh, rising debt has to lead to a crisis. It's a fairly popular uh, view in the public. The other is that banks don't matter at all and uh, people that everything's controlled by the central bank and there's no problem. And banks, anybody who believes banks are different are banking mystics. And of course my good mate Paul Krugman put that point forward just recently. Why is banks so crucial to debt and money? That makes the point for me far better than me alleging it. Neoclassical economists don't include bank or debt or money in their models. Which is why they didn't see a crisis called by banks, debt and money coming. <laughs> so I'll go through the first fallacy. And that's, I'm going to use a model of a, of a 19th century free banking economy back in the days when banks did actually print their own notes. Things like this were common across America, parts of Scotland and Australia. So you had private banks producing private bank notes and lending those out. My model uh, is a simple little model that has banks printing notes and storing them in a vault to begin with, then lend them to firms, uh, and the firms then hire workers, and the workers and bankers consume, and the banks charge interest on loans and pay interest on deposits. And if this, this was, this simple model should show breakdown if the conventional popular belief that you can't borrow $100 and pay $105 back is correct. It should in one turn up in one of two ways. Either you should need a, a rising level of money for in debt for constant economic activity, or the banks, the people who are paying the debt should run down to zero if you only have a constant amount of money in the economy. What actually happens? Well, I'm going to build a model of this using accounting flows, a table. And that's the table. And I'll take you through step by step. I've got vaults. The bank has to assets which are either the vault, where the notes are stored before they lent out, and where they return to, or loans to firms. It has liabilities, which are the bank deposits of the firms and the bank deposits of workers and then there's a safe where the bank gets the money from charging interest and consumes out of it as well. So the first thing is you have a loan taking place. Money is transferred from the vault to the firm's account and the bank then records that it's made the loan. It then charges interest on that and to pay the interest the firm has to transfer money or the firm sector from, the, from their deposit accounts across to the bank safe and once that's done the, the, the banking sector then records that's actually been done by reducing the amount shown as being outstanding by the amount paid in the interest. Then the firms hire workers by transferring money again from their accounts to the workers. Deposit interest is paid by the banking sector to both the workers and the firms. The workers and firms and bank, workers and the banks consume by transferring money back to the firm's account to buy goods and services. And the firm sector then repays the loan by transferring money from its deposit account back to the vault and the banking sector records that that's been done. Is that fairly straightforward? <laughs> Not too bad. What it looks like when you run it as a model is that it all stabilizes down, which is not what is expected by people who believe the system is going to break down. So I'll show you this in a little computer program that simulates the money being transferred from one account to another and so on. And you'll see the flow rates, which are shown by these little circles here, ultimately settle down. The money just keeps on circulating. And all the accounts, which you can see in these graphs, stabilise over time. So that $100 million in the, in, the, in the model is circulating and generating a large amount of money, of in income over time, I'll show you that in a second, with stable bank accounts. And ultimately the system is perfectly stable as you can see. All those amounts, they're flows that are occurring on an annual basis, but they're not leading to breakdown. So the conventional view is wrong for some reason. Why? Hang on a second. Get the right slide here. Okay. I'm going to get wonkish on you here. <laughs> because what's actually being shown there is what's called a system of ordinary differential equations. And the verbal table I took you through a while ago, 
I wouldn't want to explain the set of equations to you, even showing it like that, but that's showing the overall rates of flow between the vault, the bank's loans, the firm's deposit accounts and so on. And when I put in uh, substitute functions for all that stuff, rather than having placeholders, as those words are, it looks like that. Now, I used to try to explain that to my fellow post-Keynesian economists. I had Buckley's of getting it through to them. So it's complicated. But if you understood the table, you understand that mathematics. That's why I use the table both to derive these models and to, and to uh, uh, explain them. And when I put in realistic values for those parameters in the system, such as saying workers get about 70% of the output, loans are about 5%, Firms take about seven years to repay loans, et cetera, et cetera. You can work out an equilibrium level for all that system. And what I find with those numbers is that wages on an annual basis work at about 228 million, profits are 98 million, the interest bill is about 4.67 million, and the sum is $331 million of activity with $100 million in the banking system. Now, what's going on there? Incomes are exceeding the loan by a factor of three. And the reason is simple that money turns over. $100 million is turning over more than once in a year and generating income as a result of that out of which you pay the interest. So the popular fallacy that you can't repay a loan because they charge $5 and they only give you a, a, on 100 is a, a confusion of stocks and flows because the loan itself, that initial loan, is a stock. It's then dominated in dollars. When somebody says, how much do you owe the bank? You say $100. You don't say $100 per annum. That's what you pay them in interest. Okay? The incomes are a flow. It's dollars per year, or dollars per time unit. So that mistake, that the popular one, is a popular fallacy for mistaking stocks and flows. So if you borrow 100 million, you can generate 300 million in turnover, pay a couple of hundred million in costs, get 500 million in profit, and paying 5 million interest is no big deal. That's the basic dynamics of it. And this is the sort of stuff Rich is talking about as well. Now, the second fallacy is the neoclassical one. I'm very pleased as a theologian. Are you still here, by the way? Yes. Good. Uh, interjected, why, do, why is this you know, not discussed by the neoclassical? Why don't they have it? Well, this is Krugman talking about me. <laughs> I had a lot of fun talking about him too. Um, in a paper called Minsky and Methodology Wonkish, he said that I go to assert that lending is an addition to aggregate demand. And he says, I guess I don't get that at all. <laughs> he said, if I decide to cut back on my spending and stash the funds in a bank, which lends them out to someone else, this doesn't have to represent a net increase in demand. Now that's blatantly what Richard is saying, what they believe. I, I, I have to, we don't have to allege anymore, we can quote, we can quote Krugman. I think I'll send him a Christmas present. Um, and he called what Richard and I do and Anne and co, banking mysticism. Uh, he says, where the left and the right meet, Austrians at one the right hand extreme and Minciites like myself and my colleagues here, uh, somehow believe that banks are outside the rule, they've got unique powers for good and evil. And he says, but that's not true. He says, banks don't create demand out of thin air. Uh, they are just one channel linking lenders to borrowers. And therefore, since they see them as just intermediaries, they think you can abstract from them and model the macro economy. Now, the ironic thing I've learned about neoclassical economists is uh, that they don't actually know their own literature. And I'll show you that in a moment. But this is the vision they have. Patient lends to impatient, the bank just sits in the middle, patient spending goes down, impatience rises, no change in aggregate demand, you can ignore debt and you can ignore banks. That's the logic, the a priori, sitting in the armchair, Jeremy Bentham style, logic that means they don't actually think about it. The real world is like this. An entrepreneur or a speculator approaches a bank and says, I've got a great idea, and the bank says, yep, that's a great idea, we reckon, here's a million dollars, by the way, you owe us a million dollars. It's a simultaneous creation of both the loan and the, and the deposit. So it grants a loan and it creates a deposit at the same time. And this was something which seriously well-informed, practical people in the banking sector tried to tell economists back, back in the days of monetarism, say it wouldn't work. Alan Holmes, who was senior vice president of the New York Fed, fought, fought a rear vision, you know, a rear guard action trying to stop monetarism. And he put it beautifully succinctly, in the real world, banks extend credit creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. The idea you can control them by controlling the reserves was completely, pardon the Australian French, ask about tit. <laughs> so the new loan puts additional spending power into circulation and therefore aggregate demand exceeds the demand from income alone. So they're wrong to ignore the role of the change of debt in macroeconomic analysis. And ironically, as one, the, 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 the most important revelation I had in writing the second edition of Debunking Economics was that neoclassical economists don't understand 
neoclassical economics. Okay? They don't read their own literature. They don't realize the limitation that literature puts upon their own modeling. So I love the fact these two guys, Kidlin and Prescott, got the Nobel Prize for inventing real business cycle theory, which is the travesty that's led to the total failure of neoclassical economics to see this crisis coming. But they did some fantastic empirical work in 1989-90. And looking at a whole range of variables, they concluded, amongst many other non-neoclassical conclusions, which they admitted in the paper, contradicted standard theory literally wrote that. They said there's no evidence that the monetary base leads the cycle, which is necessary for the theory of money multiplier as to how the whole process occurs. If the money multiplier is correct, then M0, base money has to change first, and later credit money moves down the stream. Instead, they found that the credit money led base money. Led, led the cycle by three quarters and, the, and base money by another quarter again. So that contradicts the, the money multiplier model that they happily use to dismiss the importance of money in banks. Famer and French, who were the, you know, the, 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 the street warriors for pushing the efficient markets hypothesis down people's throats, they did great empirical work back in 89, 1999 it was, and they looked at what actually causes changes in investment at the aggregate level by corporations with a huge database. And they said that the, the, the source of financing most correlated with investment is long-term debt. It's at the aggregate level, adding up all American corporations, huge database they had. They said debt plays a key role in accommodating year-by-year -year variation in investment. So the source of investment funding is the change in debt. And that's why, aggregate, why it's so important in aggregate demand. So debt and endogenous money matter incredibly in our economics and they're completely left out on a priori non-empirical reasons by neoclassical economists. And as Richard points out you know, very importantly as well, it can be the source of good stuff, which is investment, the source of bad stuff, which is speculation. And of course, banks have gone for speculation. So the neoclassicals, they're useless in this area. And their own models are themselves useless and contradict their own foundations. Now, I got abused by Krugman in the page of the New York Times, the, the, the web page of the New York Times, uh, for characterizing the neoclassical model as being like the old model of uh, Ptolemaic astronomy where everything was seemed to be circular motion and then to actually make it fit the reality that the planets would therefore reverse direction around the Earth if that were so, they added epicycles on the main, the main deference cycles. This is not me saying these current quotes here. Have a guess who it is. The preferred model has a single agent optimising over infinite time with perfect foresight, rational expectations, uh, flawlessly realising through perfectly competitive forward-looking markets for goods and labour, blah, blah, blah. How could anyone expect a sensible short to medium macro to come out of that setup? It was Robert Solo. He's been screaming at these guys for a decade or more, saying what you've done is totally nonsensical. You can't do macroeconomics this way, and they've ignored him. It's not just me being put down by these guys, it's Robert Solo being ignored as well which is ironic given his role in the capital controversies. Though I will admit, he at least he joined the debate. And then he talks about the epicycle editions by the uh, new classical, by the new Keynes. You think they're so different. I had one of these, and he's a nice bloke, Mark Thomas, I must say. I enjoyed meeting Mark in Berlin. I think I've got a chance for a dialogue with him, which is tremendous. I do want to have dialogue. But um, they got really angry when I said they're related to the real business cycle mob by adding on frictions and so on. Well, this is Robert Solo saying the same thing. The basic model has perfectly smooth motion. The new, the new Keynesian model adds in little wobbles and frictions to try to get the results that fit the data. So you see, he actually calls them freer spirits than the real business cycle, which will really annoy them, school. And he said, this then sounds better and fits the data, but well, duh, intelligent economists chose these numbers to make it fit the data better. Not because it explains it any better. Again, it's like epicycles on the Ptolemaic vision of how the uh, solar system works. Now, Solo pointed out one of the major reasons why these guys can't be trusted, not knowing their own literature. And he said they, they defend it by saying it's derived from general equilibrium, and therefore it's superior to models that don't have the street deep foundations and the deep structural parameters of the theory. And he said they call these DSGE models. I got, I got knocked for using exactly the same classification that, uh, that Solo did here. I found it very, very funny. And he says the cover story. This is what he's calling it. And that's again like Anne's comments about those guys, can in no way justify using this representative agent abstraction. And he talks about what are called the Sonnenschein Mantel de Burr conditions. Now ram this down their throats, people, because these invalidate not just the micro foundations of macroeconomics, they even invalidate being able to do supply and demand in a single market. Because what they prove 
the sound is putting it the way that a mathem mathem mathematical economist does. They say every polynomial can be an excess demand function in some given market. Now, a polynomial is a squiggly line that doesn't cross itself and doesn't go up, doesn't go up, up and have two values for the one input. Any line you draw like that is a valid market demand curve. So market demand curves do not obey the law of demand and therefore there's no way you can treat a single market as being a blown up consumer. So if you had Crusoe to Robin, and Robinson Crusoe to Friday, both of whom have neoclassical utility functions, that's the market demand curve you can get. You can't even do supply and demand analysis with that. And yet they treat the entire macroeconomy as one scaled up individual, if you're lucky too. Uh, so their advice is useless. Ignore them like they've been ignoring us for the last six years, six decades. So back to why banks cause crises. Well, simply put, they, they make profits by creating debt. And they can go about it in several ways. This is the same model where I've added in investment, the one I showed you earlier, and saying, what if they recycle more rapidly? Well, that gives them a bit, bit more money than the base case. Have loans repaid more slowly? That's a bit more base money. What they really get the extra bang for the buck out of is getting extra investment or speculation. Now, why do they choose speculation instead? Well, because if they actually get us to do things which are based on our incomes, we don't borrow all that much. This is the ratio of, how, of personal debt in Australia to GDP over 20 years. Pretty damn volatile, rose like crazy from 1994 to 2008. Looks like a real problem, doesn't it? That's personal debt. So this is now rescaling it by the change in mortgage debt. Okay. It's only when we get into asset price bubbles do we really borrow, borrow on an enormous scale. And it's the bank lending that causes the crisis, the, the bubbles themselves by a feedback loop. Now, to give you an analysis of that, there are two sources of demand. You can either, if you're going to buy something, you can either earn the income for it or you, borrow, you, you, you swipe your credit card. Instantaneously, that's where aggregate your demand comes from. And because of endogenous money, it scales up to the national level. Okay, so income is aggregate demand plus the change in debt. And there's two things we spend it on, goods and services and new, uh, net financial assets, driving up the price of financial, or adding, adding to the valuation of financial assets. And Schumpeter made the point that incomes are mainly spent on consumption, whereas the change in debt mainly fin finances investment, and Minsky points out it also finances Ponzi behaviour. So putting it in a simple equation, wages and profits go across to consumption, the change in debt finances both investment and net transactions in what's known as the fire economy, finance, insurance, and real estate. So putting that together, I have what I call the volrath schumpeter minsky law to replace the money-less Volrath law that neoclassicals are so obsessed with. And I can then expand that net financial transactions into the price level times the quantity times the turnover, and then show the, the role of the change in debt in driving level of employment and output as, as Richard's done as well. But I can take it one step further and that's to say that it's given that aggregate demand is going to be spent on goods and services and financial assets, the change in aggregate demand is spent on the change in GDP and the change in assets, and that means there's a relationship between the acceleration of debt and the change of asset prices, and also, of course, change in GDP. And all this explains the crisis we've been through. So, again, looking at the scale of it, again, Anne's done this very well for, uh, for England. This is looking at for America. Private debt doesn't matter. Oh, sorry, public debt doesn't matter compared to private debt. The obsession with public debt is a mistake. And then when you look at the period we're in now, only the roaring 20s and the, the, and the great moderation are alike in the data, and only the great depression are now are alike in the data. That's the phenomenon we're having to deal with. Now looking at uh, the contribution that aggregate, the change in debt made to aggregate demand, the red line is aggregate demand, income alone, the black line and the blue line add in change in private and public debt. This is today in America. A far bigger scale, but a far faster reversal of the process by the growth in government debt. Look how much bigger the gap is between the blue and the black line in that previous simulation. Now looking at the acceleration of debt and the relation to change in employment. Acceleration of debt is a major factor driving change in employment back in the, great in the roaring 20s and the Great Depression and in the great moderation and the crisis we're in now. And the deceleration of debt now is the greatest in history, greater than the Great Depression. It also drives stock markets. That's the correlation between acceleration in debt and change in share prices from 1920 to 1940. The correlation is still there at monthly data for our current experience. And again, you can see the down and the up in the acceleration of credit driving the behavior of the stock market. 
and looking at house prices. Uh, I love this one. This is the, this is the ratio of, of real house prices. Uh, the CPI is using an index of nominal house prices divided by the CPI, setting it to 100 back in 1890 and going forward. Greenspan, at the point I've got the chart there, said there was no bubble to Congress. And if it burst, there wouldn't be many problems. Gee, thanks, Alan. Helpful. Uh, and now when you look at the acceleration of mortgage debt and the change in house prices, again, you find this massive correlation. Okay? That's what's driving the bubble. That's why it burst, not just the rising of interest rates, as Anne said, but nothing can accelerate forever, not even debt. When it decelerates, the price direction changes and the bubble endogenously bursts. I'm about to be pushed off stage here by Sarah. So fasten your seatbelts, people. You're in for the same roller coaster. The red line is you. The blue line is the Americans. You're far worse. And when the crisis comes, your employment's likely to go down. Your house prices are likely to go down. And your share market is likely to go down. And of course, the hot money will leave the country uh, faster than you can hop on a, well, faster than you can get to Heathrow. So my sources and remedies, because accelerating debt is the cause of the bubble and the cause of the crisis, we have to break the nexus between accelerating debt and changing asset prices. So I have two proposals there. What are called Jubilee shares. I'm sorry, but I have to go over for this one, Sarah. Um, which would be shares that last forever like they do right now if you buy them from the company and you can sell them on the secondary market up to seven times, but after the seventh sale, it lasts 50 years and then expires. So the idea would be you're an absolute idiot, not just a greater fool, but an idiot to borrow money to buy a Jubilee share. It's keeping them out of the secondary market while letting borrowed money into the primary market. And the other I call the pill, which stands for property income limited leverage. And that is to put the maximum amount that you can secure against a house or property, commercial property as well, to some multiple, say 10, times the income of the property. And that means that you would no longer have people competing to get higher leverage so they could beat somebody else for buying a house or buying a property. And it doesn't rely upon regulators, doesn't rely upon fine tuning, but it cuts out that feedback loop between rising asset prices and rising debt. And finally, for today's crisis, as Anne mentioned, I'm in favour of what I call a modern debt jubilee or quantitative easing for the public. Um, we, you can cancel the debt that's been created irresponsibly by the banking sector without penalising savers by an injection of money not to the bank's reserve accounts but to the accounts of the public on condition that the first use of it must be pay the debt down. If you're in debt, you must reduce your debt by that amount. If you're not in debt, you get a cash injection. Now that ended up benefiting, not penalising either side of the saver borrower equation, but squeezing the banks because of course their income and assets would fall, their non-income and assets would rise. So that's the proposal I have there and that's it. Thank you.